<coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I, I hear that you can hear me. So, um, thank you for staying with me. Um, I'm going to talk about a bit uh, uh, about graphs and especially about um, Google's Brickle framework to actually process large-scale graph data. <coughs> so, a bit about me. So, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm working for a database that is called ArangoDB. I'm part of the core team there, and I'm responsible for the web front end, uh, graph visualization, and other graph features, including the Pregle framework that we implemented. Um, in my free time, I'm hosting Cologne.js. That's the JavaScript me meetup in Cologne, where I'm based. And uh, for my education, I'm holding a master's degree uh, in computer science with a specialization in databases and information systems. Um, yeah, but this talk is actually not about me. It is about the Pregel framework and about graphs. And therefore, let's talk about graph algorithms, the classical graph algorithms, so everything that you might already know. So classical graph algorithms, I would actually declare them into three different parts. First of all, we have pattern matching algorithms. So we give a pattern for the graphs. So I, I have A connected to B, where the connection is like married or something. And if I want to get an answer for that query, I have to search the entire graph. And then I can identify similar components, so all pairs of A and B that are married. <coughs> and in order to do that, I have to touch all the vertices and the neighborhood if that is defined in my pattern. Next big thing, traversals. So traversals are starting at one specific point. Most of the time, it's one vertex. And from there on, you iteratively um, explore your graph and try to collect some data. So for example, you start at one point and try to find the shorter, shortest path to some, to some other point that could be done with a traversal. <coughs> a special thing about traversals is in every step, you know the results of all previous steps. So if I'm at the third vertex in a traversal, I know what the vertex 1 and vertex 2 has stored already. And the last thing are what I call global measurements. So the idea is to compute one value for the complete graph based on its vertices or edges. So that is, for example, the count of vertices, edges, simple things, but also radius diameters. <coughs> Or I can compute one value for each vertex or each edge, each edge, for example, the page rank of the graph. That is one value for each vertex. But most of these algorithms actually require a global view on the graph. And as we are on a big data conference here, we are now considering a graph that is large, and that is so large that we cannot store it on one machine. And as soon as we have this scenario, all three of these algorithms are quite hard to implement. So pattern matching is OK as long as the neighborhood is located on the same server. Otherwise, I have to find one vertex for a start and go to another server to find the other part of the pattern, and that is quite hard. Even worse, it is with traversals, because there I have to either take my, compute compu my complete computation up to now and transfer it to the other server where the other vertex is stored, or pull the data from the other server from the other vertex. And there, it might be that the traversal is so large that it covers the complete graph, and then I would end up in sucking all the data into one server again, and that doesn't fit, so that it will not work. And for global measurements, the problem is that I cannot get a global view of the graph, because it's too large. <coughs> and to overcome this problem, Google has released its Pregel framework. So Preal is a framework to actually query distributed directed graphs. And directed is not really a restriction for a graph, because an undirected graph is simply a directed graph. They ignore the direction. <coughs> Preal is also known as the MapReduce for graphs. And that is because it uses the same faces. So it has a map face, it has a reduce face. But it uses several iterations of MapReduce, so several MapReduce steps one after another. And it tries to operate all the servers that we have in the cluster at full capacity at all time, if that is possible. And on the same way, reduce the network traffic, because that is what we pay for having a graph distributed in a cluster. And we don't want to pay that much, so reduce that. <coughs> Pregel is especially good at calculating 
um, measurements and values that are touching most of the vertices or all of the vertices in the graph. And it's really bad at calculating values that just touch a few of your, uh, your vertices. So if you just want a path from A to B and you just find it by go from A, go to C, go to D, and then go to B, mm, it's not really good for Pregel. Pregel is really good for working with most of your vertices at the same time. How does this work now? And I think that's best explained by an example. So let's take our really huge graph that is distributed across, across two servers. This actually have, has um, seven vertices. And what I would like to find out now is the connected components. So I have three of the vertices connected on top and four of the vertices connected below. And they are distributed across two servers, one left and one on the right-hand side. And the idea of what I would like um, to create now is to assign a value to each of my vertices such that the value is equal for these three um, uh, vertices up here and equal for the four vertices down here. And it's actually not that this one has the same value as the other one, so they have to be different. Otherwise, it would be really easy to assign the same value for all of them it's done, but they have to be different values because they're not connected. Um, <coughs> and I would implement it like this, that I will just take the ID of a vertex, so that's the inner part of the circle, and just try to get the smallest number, so the smallest ID of a vertex in each component, and assign that to each of my vertices in that component. So that would be the ideal result, would be a 1 stored to all the 4s here, and um, a 5 stored to 3 vertices up here. So now, how is Pregel going to do that? So at first, it starts with all the vertices active. That means it is iterating over all the vertices that I have in my graph. I cannot pre-filter them. <coughs> then I can just go to each of these vertices, take a look at what is stored as this vertex. So for example, the, the ID of the vertex here. And I get a handle to all the outgoing edges. So for vertex 1, I don't get anything except its ID. But for vertex 2, I will get the outgoing edge that leads from 2 to 1. And on the edge, I can find where the target vertex is located at. And that is really important. That is a requirement for the database that we are using below that. Otherwise, it would be really hard to implement it. <coughs> so what I do now in my first step is I simply read the ID of a vertex, store that directly on the vertex, so I store all the um, values on top. And now I can use the edges that I have a handle to and send a message um, containing the value that I just have stored. So below here, for example, the 2 is storing the 2, and it is sending alongside this edge the value 2. The idea behind that is that 1 can now decide, um, I know that I'm maybe in component 1, and gets informed by um, the other vertex 2 that he's connected with 1, because 1 doesn't know it. And then 1 can decide, OK, is 2 now below 1 or not? And if so, it can just change the number accordingly. So 1 will then, then decide, OK, 2 is like larger, so it won't do anything. <coughs> but for example, the 6 here will receive the 5, and then it can just um, uh, see that 5 is below 6, so it will change the stored 6 to a 5. <coughs> so right now, we are in the phase that each vertex um, has sent to all its outgoing neighbors a message, um, and then it is deactivated. And the idea of the deactivation is to terminate the pregle at one point in time. So as soon as all vertices are deactivated and there are no messages sent, pregle will terminate and will store the result. <coughs> so right now, all vertices are terminated, so it might be stopping now, but we have messages sent, so we have uh, some of the messages in the yellow boxes here. That means there's the next iteration of the MapReduce step. Now all vertices are activated that are still activated, and all the vertices that receive a message are reactivated. So that means most of the vertices are reactivated, except 4, before, because 4 has no in ingoing edges, doesn't receive a message, so it, st it stays deactivated and thinks, okay, maybe I'm already finished. 
Next step is that the messages that we have sent will now be delivered to all the vertices. And then they can do what I just explained. They compare the value they have stored with the message they have received, with all the messages they have received. And then they store them accordingly. So for example, the, the seven will switch to six, the six will switch to five, five will stay, and all of them will stay here too. And now comes the next track. Two has sent something to one. And therefore, one knows now, OK, I know that there, might, uh, there is a vertex which is called two. And two could now send the information, the contact information for vertex two over the edge to vertex one. And doing this allows vertex one to send a message back to vertex two, which was not possible in the first step. So what I can do now is send um, messages alongside the edge and against the edge forward and backward messages. And that is what I do now, because right now, um, two doesn't know that it uh, would be connected to one. But now one is uh, allowed to send back the lower number to two. And therefore, we go to the next step, so we still have messages, and reactivate all the vertices receiving messages. Um, we deliver them to the vertices now. <coughs> and what you can see here, two has switched to one and sends the one back to four, and back to three. Other important thing, three has switched to two, and four has also switched to two. But they do not know that the other one has switched. And therefore, they are both sending the smaller number alongside the edge. Which means we have an, well, a, uh, essentially a necessary message, but we could not figure that out because, th because they are on different servers. And if we continue doing that, we can now just reactivate three and four. They will rece receive the one, do the same thing again, and then finally activate them. They both have stored the one, and that's it. So the uh, component below has stored the one, and the component be above has stored the five now, which is quite good for the simple algorithm. <coughs> so how is that done in an architectural overview? So we have actually two components of a pre sequence. First one is a conductor. Um, in the original paper, that one is called the master, but as I'm from the database point of view, master is always like coined for all the other things, so we renamed that to something that we haven't used yet, therefore we call that conductor. Um, the other things are workers, and workers are located at the data, on the database servers. And the conductor could be um, stored somewhere else. It can be um, either on the same server or it can be on a different server, doesn't care. Um, and the conductor is the thing the user interacts with. The user says to a conductor, I want to execute the Pregel algorithm now, and I want to execute that on this data set. And that's it. <coughs> so the user actually doesn't know anything about these workers. Then the conductor now goes and sends the algorithm to the workers and says, OK, now we start a new Pregel algorithm. And this is the algorithm you should execute. Then the workers go ahead compute over all the vertices, and send messages between the vertices. And that is really done without any knowledge of the conductor. And as soon as they are finished, they asynchronously call back to the conductor and say, OK, I've finished now with step one. On my server, there are still some active vertices. So they send him a count. And they send him how many messages they have sent. And the conductor now has to decide, do we continue with the next iteration? or don't we continue? <coughs> and as we have sent now active vertices and messages were underway, the conductor will decide to go into step two. And then he will just trigger all the, the, vertices, um, the database servers again and say, start your workers, step two now. Then they will just do all the um, Pregel stuff again, will execute over all the vertices. Um, they do not send any messages now, and they deactivate all the vertices. Um, and sent back to the condu uh, conductor that they have finished step two. And now the conductor actually decides, okay, we are finished now. Everything you have will be stored as a result. <coughs> and the result will be stored in a different graph. So the original data set is untouched by a Pregel algorithm. You cannot modify that. You get always a subgraph in a different graph stored as the result. <coughs> but how is it, um, why is it called MapReduce now? And that is the entry points for us developers to actually implement the Pregel algorithms. 
So most important thing is the worker algorithm. We have to implement that ourselves, and that is the thing that is delivered to all our database servers and is mapped over all our vertices. And that is actually the map step, because it maps the your algorithm over all your vertices, and as an output, it creates a set of messages to other services, uh, to other vertices. <coughs> In that algorithm, you have as available parameters the current vertex with a handle to all its outbound edges. Then you get all incoming messages, and you get some global values that can be predefined at the beginning of an algorithm. <coughs> and it allows modifications on the vertex. So you can attach a result to the vertex or end to his outgoing edges. And you can even delete the vertex and his outgoing edges. And if you delete the vertex, it will never ever be reactivated by Pregel. So as soon as you delete it, it is gone. And then you can deactivate the vertex. That means the vertex now thinks it doesn't have to do anything more in the next step, but can be reactivated by receiving a message. And that is actually the map step we know from MapReduce. <coughs> next thing is a combiner. And combiner is the reduce step, because that reduces all the generated messages we have gotten from our worker. <coughs> so the output then is an aggregated message for each vertex. And the idea behind that is that we compress all the messages sent from server A to server B to the minimum amount that's possible. Because we can aggregate um, and reduce all our messages on the server level and just send one aggregate to the other server. And that's it. <coughs> and then it is executed on the sender side, for the reasons I've just talked about, but also on the receiver side. Because then you can just put in one message into one vertex, which is easier to, um, to handle. <coughs> but the actual original implementation of uh, Pregel does not make any guarantees when a combiner is executed or not. He leaves that up to the actual implementation. <coughs> what do you have as available parameters? This is really easy now. You have the